Welcome to Alzheimer's Speaks Radio. I'm your host, Lori LeBay, and I'm so excited that you're joining us today. We are going to have a fascinating conversation, as usual, as we learn from people all around the world at all ages and stages of life. Stay tuned as we shift our dementia care from crisis to comfort. Here we go. What you think about? And welcome back to Alzheimer Speaks Radio. I'm your host, Lori LeBay, and I hope you enjoyed our opening song called Clarion Call by the Mark Arneson Band featuring My Adore. You can download that on any of your favorite music platforms. For those of you that are new to Alzheimer Speaks Radio, we're about sound information, not just sound bites. That's why we like to have an hour long conversation with real people who are in it to win it. And that means those that are diagnosed, those that care and serve them, advocates, researchers, and more. This is a time for us to come together to really make a difference in the world. And I know we are doing that because your likes, your clicks, your shares have made a huge difference in terms of our footprint in the world. And that's, that's because you care. You know more people need to hear real information about how to live with dignity and graciousness with dementia. So thank you for helping us build this sense of community. Now, before we get started and I introduce our guest today, who I'm just like thrilled to have on um, because she is a person living with dementia over in Australia, I want to give a shout out to the Memory Cafe directory. They, you know, they are gathering so much information for all of us to find memory cafes all around the world at this point. Though there are limited numbers because of COVID, there are virtual memory cafes that you can participate in. So go to the memory cafe directory.com. And then also another great resource, especially because there's not much for respite out there, check out Coral Health, that's C-O-R-O, Coral Health, Dot com and you can download two of their apps for free. One is called Music First and the other is Coral Faith and they are both absolutely fantastic. And I always am encouraging people to, you know, join a trial if you can. And there's a trial out there called the Gain, G-A-I-N, the Gain Alzheimer's Trial, and it is for people between 55 and 80 who have mild to moderate Alzheimer's disease and also have a care partner who's willing to go to appointments with them, help with reporting and medications and so forth. Now last, uh, I just want to hear from a group who has developed the Foot Bar Walker, and then I will introduce you to Sarah. Introducing the life-changing Foot Bar Walker. I'm Peggy from Danville, Kentucky, and I'm 91 years old. The Foot Bar Walker revolutionized my care of George. The saving that I made from having to put him in a nursing home came to about $192,000. The Foot Bar Walker opens and closes just like a standard walker. The only thing that is different is the top bar and the foot bar. Does that ever make a difference? Does someone you love use a walker? Do they struggle to get up from a seated position? Are you a caregiver dealing with physical pain and stress as you help your patient? The Foot Bar Walker was designed to assist not only the patient, but also the caregiver. Patients have more control standing up, and no lifting from the caregiver is required. See how it works at thefootbarwalker.com. That's thefootbarwalker.com. Peggy, would you recommend the Foot Bar Walker? Do I ever? I would not be in the health that I'm in today at this age had it not been for the Foot Bar Walker. So, Sarah Ashton is our guest today, and she was diagnosed with early onset dementia at the age of 57. Now, at that time, she was working as the senior district manager for New South Wales Health, and that was in the mid-north coast. 
Now, her position responsibilities included district management of accreditation, risk management, consumer advocacy, and legislative compliance. So that's, that's a lot, a lot of job responsibility. Now, overnight, Sarah lost her job and most of her friends as the diagnosis of dementia became known. And so for the past few years, Sarah has been working as an advocate for Dementia Australia. She also sits on the board for the National Dementia Advisory Council. Sarah loves animals and shares her house with two dogs and five birds. And I can tell you right now, you're not going to be disappointed in this conversation. But let's start out with you telling us about what type of um, changes did you see in yourself as far as maybe behaviors or skill sets, or did others recognize changes were happening, you know, prior to your diagnosis? Laurie, there were a couple of things I would say is that I noticed that it took me longer at work. I was spending longer days at work because I seemed to have, you know, it was just taking me that much longer to do stuff. And then it was my mother who was 97 at the time, I've got to tell you, but she was absolutely alert and orientated. And she kept saying to me, Sarah, when I'm gone, because she was very ill at the time, you must go and see about your memory. And I would be, oh, come on, mum, give me a break. I'm looking after you. I'm working full time, dysfunctional relatives. You know, it's all going on, a house to look after. No, there's something wrong. I'm 97, I've got a better memory than you. And she would, this conversation would regularly happen. She'd have a go at me about my memory. And I, I sort of didn't, didn't, take much notice of what she was saying. I, I put it down to a lot of stress, a lot of work. My job, as you would have recognised from the video, was quite a big job that I had to do. And I was a pretty busy woman with my work and, and I didn't think much about it. I, I, when I did my uh, neurocognitive testing the first time, which was long before my diagnosis, the uh, psychologist, Michael, he said, oh, you're 10% below where you should be for your age group, you know. You must be finding it difficult with work. And I just dismissed him entirely. And I said, oh, yeah, you know. And I I, I just didn't... I, I was putting overlaying other issues as the contributing factor to my signs. I, had, I did have friends after they become aware of my diagnosis who told me, oh yes, we saw problems, we just didn't say anything to you about it. But I didn't really see anything. I, I just, I associated it with other issues and I was totally blindsided. If I had known, for example, that the fact that I have hydrocephalus, which is fluid on the brain, and I've had about nine or 10 neurosurgeries, would cause me to be more likely to develop it, which was the contributing factor to my initial diagnosis, I would have, I would have been very aware, I would have been watching, but no, nah, I was pretty much blindsided by the diagnosis. And it wasn't until we went through the whole sequence of things and, um, oh, I don't know, I, I, somebody suggested I went and saw Dementia Australia up here at our local office, and I did. And I took my information, because I think he knew he was a doctor, and he said, that he, now a parliamentarian, and he said, look, go and see them. They might be able to give you memory exercises. I went and saw them and, and we went through all the information and just to set the scene, he handed me a piece of paper with the top folded down and he said, um, tell me what you think of the things on this list. And I went down them and I said, oh yeah, they're all me. And there were 10 items all related to dementia. And he said, now I want you to open the top. And as I did, I could see the word symptoms of early onset dementia coming up. And like my brain just imploded. 
I don't know how I got out of the office. I think I breathed in and I forgot to breathe out for the day. He said, you've got to go back to neuro your neurologist because he said, based on what I'm reading, I think you've got early onset dementia. He said, I'll be back in touch with you. I'll have a case manager put in to help you, but you need to talk to your neurologist. I went back to see the neurologist because I had spoken to him about the fact that some of my scores weren't very good. And his comment was, join the dots. <laughs> Hence the name of my group, Join the Dots for Dementia. And I didn't. I didn't join the dots at all. Why the heck should I? And when I went back and saw him and I said, I have dementia. And he said, well, yes, I thought you knew. I said, well, why the heck would I? I said, it's why I pay you is to tell me these things. And he said, well, I actually don't like to call it dementia. He said, I like to call it progressive cognitive deterioration that's non-recoverable. And I said, listen, Raymond, if it looks like a duck, walks like a duck and quacks like one, it's a bloody duck. And I said, let's not pretty this over. You are telling me I have got the symptoms of dementia. Well, yeah, that's, yeah, he said, the scores are pretty bad. You can't go back to work now because I'd had a, a second brain operation within three weeks. And I just sort of, my eyes popped and I got myself back to Port Macquarie and I spent a long time in Delisle. I had a heap of long service leave and annual leave and sick leave and I just stayed on that. And then he very kindly wrote to my uh, employers and uh, told them what was wrong and they just very kindly wrote to me and told me I didn't have a job anymore. Oh my um, gosh. Yes, that was a moment after 40 odd years of working for them. And uh, so my, fortunately I was secure, I, I had my own home, I was okay. And we have what we call the disability pension out here, which I was able to get. And that allows me, allows me to live modestly, not lavishly, but modestly, and I had some savings. So I manage um, with my day-to-day -day stuff. I can't travel anymore. So I don't have many wants and needs and I stick to home. And after two years of being curled up on the couch in the fetal position, I decided to get up and get on with life and try and work out how I was going to manage the new me. I think aside from losing my job, the other great loss was I lost friends hand over fist overnight. They just vanished. Like you would have thought I, they were afraid I was going to run down the street naked or something because they just shot through. And um, I had to start again and I had to find a new pathway in my life and some new purpose and some new direction. And that took a long time. It's still a developing thing. This COVID thing has shot it to pieces because all of the things I had that I was doing, the meetings I was attending, I was looking after the dementia garden at the hospital. I was doing a lot of stuff. I, I was suddenly cut off from doing it. I'm still not back doing it except by Zoom for the meetings. And so... I'm back to being in this sort of isolated stage at the moment. But, you know, life is just, it's a new normal. It's a new normal. And fortunately, um, we have out here a thing called the National Disability um, Support uh, Scheme, which provides uh, household uh, support in the home uh, a budget for it and each year I get reviewed and, and I get a budget that helps me over and above my pension to do things like I, I uh, because I don't have control of my hands anymore with some of my, one of my medical problems I get help with mowing and with gardening and I get help with cleaning and I can't cook anymore so I get help with food preparations I get help with shopping Anything I need done, I have um, a case manager through Dementia Australia. I have a support person who 
does things like books, trips, if I've got to go somewhere. Uh, I've got lots of help. I am extremely and eternally grateful to the government for developing this scheme. It was developed under the Labor government and I will be forever grateful to the Prime Minister at the time, Kevin Rudd, for developing this scheme because it, it's, it's a beauty. It, it, it is helpful and, wow. and we're lucky to have it. We are big big. In the U.S., we don't have anything comparable to that. In fact, people who are diagnosed, especially young onset, they uh, they have to fight to get you no know, a disability income. Sometimes they're turned down three times. Have to hire a lawyer to go through the process, um, and it's just you know it's it's disrespectful and demeaning that you have to scratch and beg. Um, to get some basic services, but then as far as the additional services you have, that's really, really rare. Um, so I've actually um, had that. Uh, I give this very poignant example. We had a, a young girl that I, I know from or knew from uh, down uh, Victoria Way. Uh, she has a well publicized story of her diagnosis. Rebecca was 35 and six months pregnant when she was diagnosed with Alzheimer's caused by the gene, um, the Alzheimer's gene. Right. Now, they tested everybody else in her family. She was the only one. They tested her little girl when she was born. She didn't have it. But by the time, it was so aggressive, it just ravaged her brain. And from the six months of pregnancy to when uh, she had Amy, she didn't realize someday she'd had her and she died within 12 months of her being born. Her husband could not get her um, a pension initially because uh, our government kept saying, no, she doesn't have Alzheimer's. She's too young. She's too young. And like, come on. Um, and eventually, you know, after copious doctor's letters of support and all of that but it was well by the time that she was in a nursing home it was it was an awful circumstance for them but yes um people people get very surprised when they hear there's over a hundred types of dementia that six of them are children's dementias and the youngest one i've ever known is a little girl who was two diagnosed with it and died at two and a half uh, of a thing called Newman-Picks disease. Well, you know, it, it happens. And uh, as a, a community, it behoves us to become informed as government. It behoves them to become informed so that people do not suffer unnecessarily uh, because of something that is totally beyond their control. Totally. Yeah, oh, I, I agree. Um, what was the most difficult part of getting diagnosed for you? Most difficult part? I think knowing the diagnosis. I'm a clinician. I, I am a nurse by trade. I, I trained back in 1977, a long time ago. And um, I had nursed... I, I ran a rehabilitation and stroke ward, and so I had dementia patients on my ward. I think sometimes a little knowledge is a dangerous thing because you overwhelm your brain with what's going to happen to you. And there, I would go through, as I said, the denial, but I went through raging anger. I really did, and trust me, I can get quite cantankerous when I put my mind to it. But it was that understanding of what the general progress was. And just to give you some uh, perspective, at the time I was diagnosed, there was a, a little group within uh, the uh, sort of support group formed where we'd go and we'd meet once a month uh, through Dementia Australia. And there were seven of us diagnosed at the time, which is now uh, five years ago. Would you like to imagine how many of those people are still alive? They're all early onset dementias. It'd be maybe half, not even. One. 
Yeah. One, the last one died, John, my, my darling friend, John, and Hazel always never minds me talking about him. He died at 51 in November mm -hmm. and John's dementia just basically burned through him within five years. He was diagnosed at 46, died at 51. His dementia came as a result of, um, uh, how, how do I describe it? A deliberate brain injury given to him as a child, shall I put it diplomatically speaking? And uh, that was when he was five and six. And the doctors were able to trace that very old brain injury back to say, this is what's caused your dementia. And it just sort of burned through his brain over five years as it burned through my other friends' brains over five years. And, and that, that loss of all of those friends in that period of time, that has been very confronting to me. It always is confronting. I sort of, uh, I, I never know how, how I'm going to feel about it from one day to another. As I said, I, I think I've got a very uneasy alliance with dementia. I, I tolerate it and it tolerates me. Yeah. Uh, mine is a different form because a lot of people... If I've had it said to me once, I've had it said to me a thousand times, you don't seem like someone who's got dementia. And after I grit my teeth and the last time it was said to me, I snapped. And I said, well, you don't seem like someone who's stupid, but it goes to show we both can be wrong. And I just... It's a very difficult thing, but my type of dementia is the fact that I don't have any short-term memory and I will remember very little of this conversation with, unless I see it back again within about 10 minutes of me um, finishing because I'll have my support person and I'll say, how did it go with Laurie today? And I'll say, I've got no idea. And she will expect that because I've got no short-term memory. My planning skills are really, really poor. Uh, I just, you know, it's really frayed at the edge, my planning skills. I, I have to diary everything. I, I, unfortunately, as a former risk manager, I am military precision with everything I, I diary. And, and one of the things I've been able to get through my disability is, is I can get equipment and I have an Alexa. And she um, tells me what to do. It's time to take your medicines. Uh, make sure the dogs are fed. Make sure the birds are fed. Clean their cages. I have a whole list of duties. And she tells me about those every day, reminds me to do them. The morning duties and the afternoon duties. And that's just brilliant. Aside from playing music, which she often does for me early hours of the morning. Um, you know, but I don't have, at this stage, the cognitive issues. When they kick in and I lose insight, that's when I will really be in trouble. That's because if I've got no short-term memory now, I will really be in trouble without my cognitive insight into my condition. I, I can recognise danger and I, I don't... On the days I'm not feeling well, I say, well, I won't go out today or I'll get somebody to come and get me today rather than doing anything that I shouldn't do. I'm still able to drive. I get assessed for that, so I'm still able to drive. But I can cognitively say to myself, well, no, I don't think I'll drive today. And I won't. Because some days you just, your brain flatlines. Uh, don't ask me why, but that's how I describe it, it flatlines. Yeah. You know, you had mentioned using Alexa, and I was just reading an article today, um, and I would never heard of anybody doing this, and they use it as their short-term memory. So they'll say, I put my keys on the kitchen table, so when I ask later, where are my keys, Alexa knows where my keys are, <laughs> or if I've locked the door, um, so that they know, and I thought, that's brilliant. 
I haven't thought about the keys because I'm always losing that. Thank you for that tip. Yep. Oh, my gosh, yes. I just tried to call Sally and she didn't answer, so remind me to try calling her again or something. Now, the interesting thing is I don't like the phone. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people I know with dementia don't like using the phone. I don't like talking to a disembodied voice. I don't mind Zoom because I can see you so I can associate the voice. After a while, I feel like I'm lost in this void. I would have the smallest phone bill on record because I don't use it. I use SMS on my mobile, but I don't tend to use the phone. Um, very much at all. Well, I think that's common. I hear more and more people say, I didn't know that I read lips and that I was reading all the nonverbals and without it, it doesn't make sense to me. The other thing that I always like to mention to people because not a lot of people associate it is one of the, one of the earliest problems I found uh, is that my skin, uh, the pathways between my brain and my skin have changed and my skin can become incredibly itchy and just patches all over the place or a patch on my back or something like that and sometimes water can irritate it and when I talk to nursing staff and I say when you have that patient who you go to shower them and you say now come on Mrs Smith we're going to do a shower now and they go no 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 you need to understand that that, in, that feeling of water on their skin is just making their brain implode between their brain and their skin. And so I always suggest to them, get a handheld shower, start from the feet up and work up the legs. And so many nursing staff have told me they have changed their practice to do that. And it's made such a difference with the patients because they didn't realise there was such an issue. And like, uh, they will constantly, they will always be rousing on patients, you know, not rousing, but you know, Mrs. Smith, don't scratch your skin. It is something going on between the brain skin pathway. Sometimes I will walk for an hour or two just to try and disrupt what I feel is going on between my head and my skin that I really want to rip it apart and it, it, it's something that a lot of people say oh gosh mum doesn't like to shower or mum mum's constantly picking at her skin they'll feel like there's ants on it sometimes I feel like I've got sand under my skin and it drives me nuts and I always like to talk about that one because not a lot of people recognize it my GP didn't know about it well, I told her. She said, oh, no one's ever mentioned it to me. I said, well, have you ever asked? Yeah. And she said, now knows to ask. Well, you know what I found out? Because my mom had the same issue with showers. And so I asked um, Tipa Snow, who's a big international trainer. Oh, I and love Tipa. I know. And she said, oh, Lori, she says, what most people don't know is that as we age, we lose our fat pads. And I said, well, my mom's a big lady. And she says, it has no, nothing to do with weight. It just, our, our nerve endings in our, in our body change. And so when that shower comes on, it's brutal. It's this brute force. And they don't understand the water's coming on. Even when they hear it, it's just, what's going on? There's a new noise. You know, they're not connecting that. And then all of a sudden, there's this pounding. So she had suggested, you know, that we do the handheld shower and do a rain handheld shower so it was lighter, so it wasn't that hard force, and then it's starting at the feet. So when I went to her, she happened to be living in a nursing home, so when I went in, I, you know, I said, I want to donate handheld rain showers for all the bathrooms. And we had this whole conversation, and he just said, Lori, you have this strange timing he's like why do you want it so I explained it and he says what else would you like in the bathrooms and he pulled out plans he says we're in the process of redoing all our bathrooms and I and so we talked about color changes we talked about piping and music we talked in about having heated towel bars and heated floors and aromatherapy and he, and he was he was just shocked 
He's like, oh my gosh, all this makes so much sense. And I said, well, and then I said, the last thing I have, and I said, I don't know if you can accommodate this one, but teach your staff to sing their old songs when they're in the shower with them. Because it just brings, you know, music brings so much peace and, and joy and stuff. And he just kind of laughed. I don't think they ever did that one. But it was just that point of you have to take in the whole environment and the physical body and then understand everyone's going to react different. Um, even earlier when you were talking about losing, you know, so many of your friends in such a short period of time for early, early diagnosis, you know, my mom was like, well, she... She started showing symptoms in her mid-50s. She didn't get formally diagnosed for 10 years because they kept blowing it off to her hormones, even though my mom would say, this ain't my girlfriend's hormones. She knew. And then she lived a long time. She lived 30 years. And people kept saying, well, she can't have it. You don't live that long. And I'm like, they don't know enough about the disease yet. You know, everybody is a little bit different with this whole thing. And I truly believe my mom lived as long as she did to teach me so that I could teach others and make a difference in the world and try to shift our dementia care culture. I mean, I think she fought tooth and nail to just keep teaching me these beautiful life lessons that apply to all of life, not just dementia. And... Okay. I, always, I always am amused when I read in the papers or see on the news that they're getting close to a cure on dementia. I love that one. And then I say, well, they've only got another 101 types to go. Yep. Because what they need to understand is they're only looking at one specific type. And every one of them, like... I tell people when you go to a doctor and he tells you, well, you know, mum's got dementia, your first question's got to be, well, what type? Well, don't, uh, and the number of patients that get, uh, or relatives that get said to them, don't worry about the type, just know they've got dementia. Well, no, that doesn't work because you need to know the type because you then need to say, well, okay, what part of the brain does that affect? And what does that part of the brain normally do? Yep. And then what, what symptoms will that cause that I need to watch with mum? And if he says, well, you know, you don't need to worry about that. What you need to worry about is changing your doctor. Because if you don't have a doctor who is prepared to accept that you need to know very specifically what's going on and you know, that we think it's a type of vascular dementia. And mine's a mixed one now. I started out as hydrocephalus and it's migrated in that there's a vascular component in it now. You have to know, well, what does that do to you? What's going to be affected? I have, I often have TIAs, little, tiny little strokes going on in my brain because I have a another odd condition that uh, called... Um, Oh, I forget, Fibro, fibromuscular uh, uh, disease, which is a weakness of the arteries, right? So I've had a hemorrhage, I've had a stroke, I've had multiple TIAs. <clears throat> and I can, I can just be walking along a street, as has happened, and I can fall over, right? And I have a care watch, which is a phone as well, and I can press that care watch and get help. Because the first time it ever happened was before I got the care watch. I was sitting within about, I would say, about five feet of people. My dogs were climbing all over me because they knew something was wrong. But not one person approached me in that 45 minutes to see if I was okay. Not one person. And it was in the boiling hot sun. And I couldn't, I couldn't. I was trying to think and I couldn't think and I couldn't work out where I had to go or what I had to do. And it took me a while, thank God, for my brain to kick in to get speed. And I eventually got myself home. The dogs knew the way. But no one asked me if I needed help. They were all sitting there chatting away nicely, but no one asked me if I needed help. And clearly I did. I just was staring into space. 
I just didn't know what I was doing. It, it is amazing how people can ignore things, you know, when they're uncomfortable. Even when you got your diagnosis or didn't get your diagnosis from your doctor, and he's like, well, I kind of figured you knew, you know. Well, use the words. It's not about how you feel about this. You know, this is this is about being honest. And, and if you aren't educated in it, then let me know that. Let me know where to go. So that I can I can get matched up with a person who can support me, not somebody uh, kind of play a game around all this. I think the reason he didn't tell me we'd worked together for probably twenty five years, and I think he didn't or he knew me for twenty five years, and I think the reason he didn't tell me was he didn't want to be the one to tell me. I had to mention he was a friend. He, but he, he told your work, you know. Uh, with I would have choked him <laughs> if it was me. I mean, I would... he just didn't want to be the one to say it. And that's why he said, oh, I thought you would have joined the dots. And I said, well, why? That's what I pay you for. Yep. You know, um, but look, it, it, yeah, it, it, it's been a strange and interesting journey. I, I have to say it's... Uh, some days are good and some days are bad. I always say that. I spend a lot of time in the garden. In fact, particularly with the COVID stuff going on, I've virtually lived in my garden. And uh, I, I, it's my comfort zone. I get out there and um, I try and keep myself at peace working in that area. I try to remember to wear my quick care watch because I've had a couple of U-Butte falls. So I've got Mount Kilimanjaro up my backyard. <laughs> um, so I've had a couple of spectacular falls down it. Um, but no, I, I spend a lot of time gardening. I, I've got my dogs, Bonnie and Clive, um, Cavoodle and Pomeranium, if you're wondering. Um, I've got the birds, which are all hand trained, and I've got I love them. They can live for 25 years. I've had to make plans for them in my will so that somebody looks after my birds, you know, um, because they can live for 25 years. It's really important to do that sort of thing. And that's something that people need to know. They, they must get their guardianship documents right and never have just one person on as guardian. I, I had a friend who had just her father on for her mother who had dementia. And dad had a big stroke and the daughter had enormous problems getting to mum's finances because no one had access except dad who couldn't do it. And so I always say have two or three people, which I do, on power of attorney and guardianship, get that all sorted because there will come a point when the solicitor will say, Mum's not in a position to be changing her will now. I, I constantly review aspects of my advanced medical directive, of my power of attorney, of my guardianship. I've put down where I want to live, you know, that I don't want to live outside the area of Port Macquarie. I've been very specific in my advanced care medical directive about how I want to be cared for at the end of life. Don't waste time doing damn tests on me if it's not going to be for any good reason, why? Just leave me alone. You yeah. know, look after me, care for me properly, ensure that I'm clean, ensure that uh, I'm given mouth care. Because right at the end, I have been very specific to say no oral feeding, no gastric tubes, no NG tubes, none of those things whatsoever. Um, because I don't want it. I, I, if I can't care for myself, if I can't interact with my family and have them understand me and me understand them, then it's time to call it quits. I'm quite pragmatic about this. Mm -hmm. I, I've been independent all my life. I do not want to live in the circumstance where I can't advocate for me. And so, you know, when it's time to pull the plug, pull the plug. And I've had that conversation with my family. They know very well. So, you know, it's all, it, it's solid there because I wanted there to be no misunderstanding about um, <clears throat> whether I was, you know, cared for <clears throat> when I couldn't make 
sense of the world or it makes sense of me because it must be so incredibly frustrating to not be able to communicate and have yourself understood and understand what the other person is saying to be able to care for yourself. I, I, I cannot imagine anything worse. And pain management is very important to reference in advanced medical directives that you are, you are managed adequately, even at the expense that it may compromise your breathing. You rather quality of life over quantity of life. And I have uh, written a, a I researched my advanced care medical directive, didn't use the New South Wales Department of Health because it wasn't worth the paper it was written on, wrote my own, and I spelt it all out, what I wanted to be done and not to be done. And I've, I've layered it up with a bit of legalese at the end that if they don't do it, my family reserves the right to take action. No, I, I think that's so important too. And we have, uh, you know, society is one that pushes that off. Well, if I talk about it or I think about it, it's going to happen. And it's like, no, it's smart living. It's, you know, and it's like you've been in control of all of your life. Why would you not want to be in control and have a say about the end of your life? The uh, one thing I want to be, uh, I, I may not be in control towards the end of my life, but I will have set up the back processes that will direct you as to how I will be cared for exactly. throughout towards the end of my life. I actually see it as the way of maintaining as much control as possible. I, I agree with you. I agree yeah. with you.